Good morning, church. How great is it to be in 2018? It's so amazing to be here this morning with you guys. Um, how amazing was Anthony last night? I love hearing Anthony preach. My big brother in the faith, always encouraging, always inspiring. And really everyone loves Anthony, isn't it, isn't it true? He's got all these like great names, like instant impact almost. And now he's the most sold out brother. That's, that's, that's pretty encouraging, right? You, you know what they called me whenever I first came back to London? I, I, it's a little bit different. I remember the first time I preached, it was at a men's midweek here in London, and they called me Killer Colby. I was, like, I was like, I really hope that nickname doesn't stick while it's stuck. And then the last time, it was uh, the White Mamba. Uh, mambas kill people. Like, you get bit by a mamba, you got 20 minutes to live, you better get to a hospital real quick. I hope that's not how you feel with the preaching this morning. So the title I've been given today is Greater Love for the Battle. Now before we can talk about the battle, we have to talk about the war. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 in verse 7. Now the whole chapter is amazing, but for the sake of time, I'll cut straight to the chase. It says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now, as I said, I'll just paraphrase the beginning part of this chapter. It talks about the woman, the woman symbolizing Israel. And this woman has a promised child, a promised offspring. And Satan wants to kill the child, but he's not able to. The child is delivered up to heaven. That's Jesus. And we know that he then decides to go to war against God. And what happens, as we, know, we see right here, he loses that war. He fights against God, he loses, he gets cast down. That's great news. The good news is, the war is over, right? That's encouraging, that's, that's great. And it gets, it gets even better than that. Because if we go, you stick your finger here, we're gonna be coming right back. But if we go to Revelation 21. The war is over. And now we have this promise of what's going to happen after the war. It says in 21 verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. This is incredible that we know that there is this war that was fought, the greatest war that was ever fought or ever will be fought. And we know the outcome of that war. And now, after this, we have this promise of this day when the old things are going to pass away. All of the, the pain, all of the suffering, all of the tears, all of the, the death, the sin is going to pass away. And the great news is that's coming one day. The bad news is it's not today. We, as, as much as we would love for it to be, I would love for, for this day to be today, but it's not. And if we want to look at what today is, we have to go back to Revelation chapter 12. Because we know the outcome of the war, but we have to see what is the aftermath of the war. What follows after this war? It says in verse 10 of chapter 12, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, 
Now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accusers of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. This is amazing. We know the outcome of the war. We know that because of Jesus, we now have salvation, that we've triumphed over Satan. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. What is the result of this war? God wins, Satan loses. But what does that mean for us? Satan fought in the heavens and he was cast out of the heavens. Where was he cast? He was cast here on earth. Where is he now? He's here on earth. This is where he's made up his domain. This is where he's making his kingdom. And that's bad news for us because he is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. If we go to verse 17, then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. Satan is enraged and he's here on earth with us. Why is he enraged? Because he fought and he lost. He went and he warred against God and he lost. And so now he's going to do the next best thing. He's going to wage war against us. And we know that that is where we find ourselves now, that the war is over, but the battle is raging. And that is my first point for us. The war is over, but the battle still rages. In 1945, this is at the end of the Second World War in May, there was a place in Austria. It was called Itter Castle. And what this place was used for is that it was a, a, a very powerful prison for, uh, for VIPs, French VIPs, that for uh, former members of parliament, for celebrities, for top athletes. They were kept in this Austrian prison for the duration of the war. Now, on May 3rd, the, the war is finishing up. The, the Allies are rolling into Berlin. They're taking over everything. The German army is surrendering. And so the German guards abandon their posts. The, 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 the prison is now empty. And so the French prisoners break into the arms and they arm themselves. They're like, hey, we're going to defend ourselves until reinforcements arrive. Because they knew the war was over. They just like, hey, we just got to hang on until the Allies get here. And then they message for help. And the, 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 the message that it went to, it went to an Austrian resistance force who then joined up with some Germans who had uh, sided now with the Americans or with the Allies. And then they came combined with an American force. And so it's, it's a bit of a, a motley crew here. You have some Americans, you have some Germans, you even have a German SS officer who is now, he's been working with the resistance. You have some Austrian resistance fighters and you have some French fighters all gathered together. And they're like, hey, the war's over. All we got to do is wait here until help arrives. This is, this is on May 4th. On May 5th, what happened was is that you had a group of 200 SS uh, German soldiers who wanted to retake the castle. And they wanted to kill everyone inside of this castle. And so you have this group of 30 people walled up in this castle, surviving, fighting this battle against this incredible army that wants to surround them and wants to kill them. This is what we are today. You look at the church, is that we're, we're, we're a mixed up crew. We're, we're not like this organized army that's well put together and everything. No, we got all sorts of different people that come here together and we're not fighting to win the war. The war has already been won. We're fighting to survive this battle that we're surrounded on all sides. Satan, Satan is coming after us with everything that he's got because he knows that his time is short. Why did these 200 soldiers come after to want to kill all of these prisoners? They knew the war was over. These were the hardline Nazis that wanted to kill as many enemies of Hitler as they could before they went down. And this army, they fought, they fought to the very end. The, the, the group inside this inner castle, they, they were fighting until they almost ran out of ammunition. And at the very end, they were like, we're going to fight hand to hand if we have to. Doesn't matter, we're outnumbered. And at that point, that's when the Americans rolled in with the tanks. That's when they crushed the enemy. That's when they delivered the victory. That's us. 
we know the war. We know the results of the war. We know that the war is over. But we are still in the battle of our lives. We are fighting against Satan who wants to kill us and kill everyone that we love. And we've got a choice. We can either fight or we can surrender. This is, it's that simple. Now, the, 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 the people fighting inside this castle, they knew what the, the results of surrendering was. They were going to get killed. There was going to be no quarter given. There was going to be no prisoners taken. They were going to be killed. And we know what happens. If we surrender and we go back over to Satan, we get killed. It's that simple. And what a sad thought to think of if someone in this group would have decided to surrender hours before they were liberated. How sad is it to think that people who are liberated from the bondage of Satan decide to surrender and decide to go back to Satan? That's what happens when people fall away. They say, you know what? I don't want to fight in this battle anymore. I don't want to keep going. I want to surrender, even though I know the war is over, even though I know Jesus died on the cross. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go back. Why? Because that's what's easy. Why do people not want to fight in the battle? Because it's too hard. They say this battle is too hard and I don't want to do it. Let's go to uh, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Let me know when you get there. The Bible says this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in now we, which now we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Why do people surrender when they know that the war is over? Because it's too hard. And the unfortunate truth is we live in a world today that places charisma over character. We, we live in a world today that, that wants to have personality, that wants to have entertainment, that wants to have razzmatazz sparkle, but no character. Because the truth is, character is only produced one way. It's produced through suffering. This is what the Bible says. There, there is no shortcut. There is no app that you can download. There is no pill that you can take. There is no secret. It's only through hard work, through suffering. And the thing is, is that we don't understand this as a society and as a generation because we are living in the easiest generation in all of history. Thank you. Martin can clap to that. I, I, I know you might be thinking your life is hard, but the truth is life has never been easier. It's never been easier. You want to talk about World War II, you want to talk about my grandfather. He, he talks about, oh yeah, I didn't see much of the war. Rebecca was there in this, we, we were visiting him in his hospital bed. He's like, I didn't see much of the war. And he told this story. He's like, and that's all I saw of the war. And he tells this other story. I didn't see much of the war, but then there was this. And that's how I saw the war. He did that like three or four times. So he saw quite a bit of the war. <laughs> and he, he, would, he told me this story about how he was walking along the beach with his father. And out of the clouds came a German bomber, not at nighttime, in the middle of the day. And the bomber strafed the beaches, and his father jumped on top of him to cover him. And they watched as the bomber flew overhead and dropped a bomb and leveled an apartment block. Wow. That's the world that my grandfather grew up in. That, that, that man has character. Because life was hard then. They had to deal with food shortages. They had to deal with uncertainty about the future. They didn't know if their island was going to be invaded. Life was hard back then. And the result of it being hard is that it produced character. When I look at the life of my grandfather, when I look at my grandma, when I look even at my parents, man, when I look at their character compared to mine, 
when I look at their life compared to mine, I see that, hey, I've got it really easy. I've got it really comfortable. And the, the truth is, I, guys, I'm not out to get anyone. I'm not trying to make you look bad. If, if you like living a comfortable life, guess what? I do too. <laughs> I, I, like, like, I, 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 like, some people like just doing things the hard way because they know it's good for them. That's not me. <laughs> like, <laughs> anyone that knows me, Rebecca's laughing there because she knows. I don't like to do things the hard way. Before I was a disciple, I believed there was a hard way and there was a smart way. <laughs> that there, there's always, there's always going to be an easier way. And then I became a disciple and I read the Bible and I realized that's not so. <laughs> and the, the truth is, if it were up to me, I would say, you know what? I've got enough character. I, need, I don't need any more hardship. I, I, don't, I don't need to do things the hard way anymore. My, I've got just enough character to get me through. I'm happy with a comfortable life. But the truth is, is that that's, that's not so. Is that I, I'm not done. I haven't arrived. My, my character isn't finished being built. And that's why God allows me, and that's why God allows you to go through hardships. It's, it's as Anthony said, when, we, when you take uh, ore and you melt it down into that fine metal, the, the gold, the silver, the copper, he talked about that, that smelting furnace with 4,000 degree heat, okay? We're the ore inside of a furnace that's 4,000 degrees. That's not comfortable. That's not nice. But it's good for us. It's going to make us more holy. It's going to give us more hope, which is going to allow us to keep fighting onwards. I don't say to the, to the younger generation out there, I don't say that you guys have got it easy to make you feel bad. That you guys are just, that you guys lack character because I'm trying to, to make you down or anything like that. No, the truth is, is that, hey, we just got to be real here. We got to understand that our idea of a hardship is when our Wi-Fi isn't fast enough to stream Netflix. That's our idea of a hardship. My grandfather had bombs dropped on him, and we've got slow Netflix. So, that, I, I'm not asking for more wars. I'm not asking if, if only people bombed me too, that would be better. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying we gotta have a sober look at our lives. We have to have a sober look at our society and our generation and understand we need more character. And where do we get character from? From the battle. God could make it easy like that. He could take away the struggles. He could take away the fights. But we need it. We need it to refine our character. And that's why God allows it, because that's what's going to get us to heaven. Now, if we want to love the battle, we need to love Jesus. And this is my second point. Loving Jesus equals loving the battle. If we continue on in Romans chapter 5, in verse 6, it says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As I've said, I don't like hardship. I don't think anyone likes hardship. No one openly invites it on their life. We're given it by God because God loves us and God wants to refine our character. And if we're going to go through the hardship, not around it, we need to understand that we're doing it for Jesus. Man. It's because of Jesus' love for us. It's because of Jesus' sacrifice for us. And when we put it in those terms, in that perspective, it makes it so much more bearable. Because think back to who you were before you knew Jesus. Think of what your life was like back then. I guarantee you, your life was much harder. I guarantee you, your life was much darker, much sadder, much more hopeless. And now, because of Jesus, we have hope. We have a future. We have a purpose. We have an incredible life laid out in front of us. Yes, it's a challenging life at times, but it's worth it. It's worth it because of Jesus' sacrifice for us. 
And so, thank you. Thank you, Coral. And so if we are going to love the battle, we need to love Jesus more and more. We need to understand his sacrifice for us that's going to motivate us onwards. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Verse 18, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So when we think of Jesus' sacrifice for us, when we think of what that means, it means that we're given a fresh start. It means that we're given a new life. We're given a new purpose. And what is that new purpose? To be the ambassadors of Christ to be the one that reconciles the world with God. Is that when sin entered the world, when Satan came into the garden, he deceived Eve, he deceived Adam, they ate the fruits, now God and man are separated. And the rest of the, the, rest of the Bible is the story of how God is going after humanity to bring them back into reconciliation with himself. And now because of Jesus, we can be reconciled. The, the, as I said, the war is done. Everything's done. All we need now are ambassadors to represent Jesus, to proclaim his message. Now, how does Satan feel about this? The, the ambassadors of Christ, those who are in the ministry of reconciliation. Well, let me ask you this question. If you woke up one morning and you had a bright idea, he said, I think... I'm going to steal some money from the mafia. Because the, the mafia, you know, they got too much money. They, they, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna steal money from the mafia. And then they found out, what would they do to you? They would hunt you down, they would find you, they would hurt you, they would hurt the people that you love, and they would probably kill you. If that's what happens when you steal money from the mafia, what do you think is gonna happen when you steal souls from Satan? This isn't a game. We're not in this as a group of people in a holy huddle that meet together to say nice things about each other. We're fighting for the salvation of the world. And Satan doesn't like it. He doesn't want us to be in this battle. He doesn't want us to be reconciling the world with God. That's why he's doing everything he can to stop us. And we need to embrace this battle. We need to let it refine us, to build up our character. Why? Because of the love of God. The love God has for us, and then that love that God has for the rest of the world. We are his ambassadors to the world, and we need to fight this battle. Now, how are we going to do this? Let's get practical here, right? Because we, we don't want to just talk about great ideas or, or principles or anything. No, no. How are we actually going to do this? Because we're, we're not just going to think about fighting the battle. We're going to actually go out and fight the battle, right? When I think of a people that were known for warfare, I think of the Vikings. The Vikings were incredible. The Vikings came over in the 10th century and they wreaked havoc all over Europe. In the same way that we're going to wreak havoc all over Europe, amen? The Vikings were a small people. They were raiding people. They would come in, they would raid, and they would leave. And what was, um, what was special about the Vikings was not their type of warfare, was not their weapons, was not anything else. What was special about them was their mindset. 
The Vikings thought differently than everyone else because everyone else, they had what was called a standing army. So what that meant, or sorry, they, they didn't have a standing army. Now we have modern day standing armies. What they had was they had a reserve army. And so a reserve army means is that everyone goes about their daily life until it's time for war. And then the person who's in charge, he gathers all of the people to fight. They gather as an army, they go fight, and then they come home, and then they go disband again. They leave until the next time to fight. The Vikings were different. The warfare battling was a part of their culture. It was actually part of their religion. Their idea of heaven was Valhalla, which was half your time was spent feasting, the other, high, the other half was spent fighting. That's what you do in heaven. You eat and you fight. That's, that's a Viking's idea of paradise. And so what the Vikings, what the Vikings would do is they would just, they would be fighting all the time. They were not like the people that they attacked because the people that they attacked, they had a wartime mentality and a peacetime mentality. When it's time to war, we fight. When it's time for peace, we have peace. The Vikings didn't do this. It was always wartime. It was always time to battle. And that's why when they would land, they would land in these English villages and they would completely catch them un unsuspecting. They, the soldiers are like, whoa, it's, it's not time to fight yet. We're not, we're not ready. They're like, we don't care. Boom, give us your stuff. And, and this is what, what made the Vikings special. And I think if I, if I want to give two things that, about the Vikings, I, this is my third and final point, is that if we want to love the battle more, we need spiritual axes and shield walls. Now, what do I mean by that? The, the, the Viking, was the, their weapon of choice was a single-handed axe. And the great thing about the axe was is that it was, it was a little bit different from the sword in that the very old swords would have been very heavy. And so you only would have used these swords when it was time to fight. You wouldn't have carried them around like just, just because. Is that, no, no, it's like, okay, you understand why they, they say, okay, now it's time to fight. I put on my sword, I go fight, I come home, I take off my sword, and I go back to my life. But the Vikings weren't like that. They used axes, which were lighter, and could be carried with them everywhere they went. And so, if you go to the forest to go hunt, you bring your axe. If you go to the river to go fish, you bring your axe. If you go to dinner, to go have dinner, you bring your axe. If you go sailing, you go have your axe. And the Vikings, the Vikings didn't care if you used your axe to chop up wood or chop up people. They always had it with them. And so we need to have our spiritual axe. Now, what does that look like? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the hearts. If the writer of Hebrews was writing to the Vikings, he would have said the word of God is sharper than a double-edged ax. Because that's, that's speaking in words that they understand. Because that was, that was what they, when they pictured that this was their ax that they would take everywhere with us. And it would have been just such an, an integral part of their life, that it was just what they did all the time. And so this is what the Word of God needs to be for us. The Word of God needs to be so natural, so familiar, that we just take it with us everywhere we go. First of all, the, the first thing we got to do, we got to literally take the Word of God with us everywhere we go. Like, you need to have a Bible, a paper Bible, with you everywhere you go. It, I, pretty much, almost everywhere... If, if I'm going to like the, the pool in a hotel, I probably don't take my Bible with me. I leave it in the room, but it's not far off. Like I, I've always got my Bible with me. And the reason why is because I've been out and I've been caught out before. I've been that guy that, that left and didn't have his weapon with them and got caught out in the battle and got killed. That's what happened to the people that the Vikings attacked. They weren't ready. They didn't have their weapons with them, so the Vikings took advantage. We don't want the enemies of God, the armies of Satan, to catch us unprepared. We need to have the Bible with us wherever we go. Literally with us, not just figuratively with us. The Bible needs to be familiar to us. As, I was, as I'm talking about this, this ax, it was, just, it was just a normal part of, of everything, is that you, they would have given it to their children. To, to just have, it's just a normal thing. You just have axes, that's what, that's what you do. 
And this is the thing for us, is that I know that this year we've had a lot of people that have become uh, disciples. We've got a quite a, a lot of young disciples. And maybe you don't know the Bible that well. Maybe you're just not familiar with it. That's okay. That, that's, that's not a problem. But you can't stay that way very long. Because what would have happened if you came in and you're like, hey, I've never seen this ax before. It's like, hey, well, we're going to battle, so you better get used to it. You better, you better, get, you better become more familiar with this. And so how do we become more familiar with the Bible? We read it. We read all of it. Not just some parts, not just the, the parts in the, the 40 days, as good as that is, but that's, that's, a, that's a tool. That's, that's, those are training wheels. We got we to take the training wheels off because we're going into the battle. And so my challenge for us is very simple. It's a simple challenge, but it's a very powerful challenge. We need to read the Bible this year, all of it. Uh, the, this year, I, uh, in December, it was probably the middle of December, I finished reading the Bible. It was so amazing Man. going through, and you read so many things. You, you understand Jesus so much more powerful when you look at Leviticus. Yes. You understand about the people of Israel in, in uh, the, the, New, the New Testament in the first century when you go through the prophets. You go through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. You understand all of these things so much deeper. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, but, but I'm not going to understand those things. Is that I, I, it takes years and years of study to be able to understand it. You're right, it does. I'm not asking you to learn everything. I'm just asking you to familiarize yourself, that you understand. That if I say, turn your Bibles to Habakkuk, you know where to go. If you don't know where to go, that's, I'm not trying to shame you. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to help you see we got a long way to go. We got to familiarize ourselves with the word of God so that way we can use it effectively in the battle. Amen, guys. We need our spiritual axes and we need our shield walls. Now, the shields during this time period that they would have been small shields and they would have been light. They would have been used for fighting against uh, melee weapons. So like swords, spears, axes, and they worked very well. But the Viking shields were different. The Viking shields were larger and they were thicker. And the Viking shields were used to, to defend against arrows. Not individually, they were used collectively in what was called a shield wall. The shields would overlap. And what it would do is it would create this impenetrable fortress that no arrow could get through. And we know if we go to, uh, I'm just quoted, uh, Ephesians, Ephesians, where am I? Ephesians 6.16, 6, the shield of faith that protects us from the fiery arrows of the devil. Right. Is that if you actually look at it, is that flaming arrows were less effective in terms of like actually killing people. They were much more effective at making people afraid and getting them to run away. And so Satan, he's not just, just trying to, to, to kill us. He's trying to hurt us. He's trying to scare us. And we need to have our shields and our shield walls together to protect us against from these attacks. And so the shield wall, it was great because it protected against arrows, but you know what else it also protected against? Horses. Horses. In 1066, you have the Battle of Hastings, where you have the, the Norman army comes in to attack here in Britain. And there, there was the, the British forces, they put together in a shield wall. And all day, the, Normandy, the Norman cavalry tried to break through the walls, but they couldn't do it. Maybe this year, you've been standing with your, with your shield, and you've been taking the, the arrows, and you're fine. You feel like, hey, I'm good. I, I've got my shield. I'm taking the arrows. But then you get hit by a horse, and then it takes you, and you're like, whoa, I was not expecting that. The, the truth is, is that if we have an individualistic approach to fighting this battle, we'll be okay. We'll be able to protect ourselves against some of the arrows. We'll be able to protect ourselves against some of the people. But when the horses, the cavalry come charging at us a million miles an hour, we're going to be decimated. The only way we're going to survive, the only way we're going to stand strong is if we fight together. We fight in a shield wall. What does this look like practically? We can't have lone wolves trying to fight the battle on their own. We can't have people that think, hey, I know the first principles really well. Good for you. That's, that's great. 
That, 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 that's not what we see in the Bible. We don't see people going off doing their own thing. We see people working together as a family. We see people working together as a unit. What made the Vikings powerful is they fought together as a unit. And this is what we need to do. My challenge for you guys is very simple, is that we need to be in Bible studies with each other. We need to be learning from each other. You need to be learning from your evangelist because they're your evangelist. They know what they're talking about. If you don't know the first principles, that's okay. Go fight alongside someone who does. Because the, the armies of the world around the, the time of the Vikings, they would teach soldiers how to fight through drills and instruction and lessons. The Vikings taught each other how to fight father to son, brother to brother. They learn how to fight in the battle side by side. And that's how we learn to fight. As, 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 it's great to have lessons and plans and instructions and drills, but if we're going to really be effective in this battle, we need to learn how to fight side by side from one another. We need to be in the battle together. And so this is my challenge for you guys. My challenge is be in three studies with three different people, three different disciples every week. This is a very, very attainable challenge. This is, this is like, it's, it's, it should be like normal, but, it, but it's not normal because I know that people aren't doing it. So let's go for three Bible studies with three different leaders. I love being in different Bible studies with different people because every time I'm always learning new things. I was so exciting being in Los Angeles. My favorite thing in Los Angeles was to go and to be in a different Bible study with a different evangelist because they all preach the same word with the same conviction with a different style, with a different flair, with a different flavor. And because of my short time, I was only there for seven months, but I learned so much because I got to be in so many different battles with so many different people. And this is what we need to do. We've got so many incredible warriors here in this church. We have veterans who have held the line who have not flinched when the arrows come, when the horses come, when the soldiers come, they have not batted an eye. And we need to learn from them. We need to have the humility to learn from one another. We need to have the heart to fight with one another side by side. And the only way we're gonna do that is not gonna be around the coffee table, it's gonna be on the battlefield. It's gonna be studying the Bible with people. Amen, guys? Greater love for the battle. We are in a battle, the battle for our lives. The good news is the war is over. The good news is Jesus is coming back one day to save the world, to save all of us, to take us on to heaven. The bad news is it's not today. We still have to fight. We cannot give up. We cannot surrender. Even though so many other people have surrendered, loved ones, friends, heroes, leaders, have given up the fights. They've gone over to the other side. We can't do that. We need to stand strong. Not because we, we just, we love the battle. No, it's because we love Jesus. Because you can love the battle and not love Jesus. You, this isn't a question of, we need more Bible studies. We need more evangelism. We need more baptisms. We need more miracles. Because if you're not doing it with the love for God, you won't survive the battle. It's too hard. So we need to get back to loving God. And by loving God, we need, we're going to love the battle. Amen. We, need to, we need to know our weapons. We need to know the word of God. This is what turns people's hearts. Not us, not our personalities, not our charisma, not our intelligence. It's the word of God, the living and active word of God. And we need to know it. We need to familiarize ourselves with this incredible, incredible book. And we need to fight side by side. We need to rely on each other people. We need, to, we need to use our faith to protect other people, not just ourselves. And by fighting together, that's how we're going to be victorious in this battle. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I am so excited for this year. When I, I, when I look out, I cannot wait for the battles. I cannot wait for the victories. Even the defeats are okay because Jesus is still Lord even when you get defeated. Amen? Amen. We stick, we stand up, we fight again. And because Jesus is Lord, he's going to bring the victory. We're going to be victorious, guys. This is incredible. 
We know that God is going to deliver us. He's going to help us to evangelize this world, and it's going to be amazing. So I cannot wait to be in the battle with you guys this year. I love you, and to God be the glory.